Chapter Six of the Call of the Wild. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Chapter Six. For the Love of a Man. When John Thornton froze his feet in the previous December, his partners had made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out a raft of saw logs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, even the slight limp left him. And here, lying by the river bank through the long spring days, watching the running water, listening lazily to the songs of birds and the hum of nature buck slowly won back his strength a rest comes very good after one has travelled three thousand miles and it must be confessed that buck waxed lazy as his wounds healed his muscles swelled out and the flesh came back to cover his bones for that matter they were all loafing buck john thornton and skeet and nig waiting for the raft to come that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish setter who early made friends with Buck, who, in a dying condition, was unable to resent her first advances. She had the doctor trait which some dogs possess, and as a mother cat washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds. Regularly, each morning after he had finished his breakfast, she performed her self-appointed task, till he came to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Thornton's. Neg, equally friendly, though less demonstrative, was a huge black dog, half bloodhound and half deerhound, with eyes that laughed and a boundless good nature. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifested no jealousy toward him. They seemed to share the kindliness and largeness of John Thornton. As Buck grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games, in which Thornton himself could not forbear to join. And in this fashion Buck romped through his convalescence and into a new existence. Love, genuine passionate love, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced at Judge Miller's down in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley. With the judge's sons, hunting and tramping, it had been a working partnership. With the judge's grandsons, a sort of pompous guardianship. And with the judge himself, a stately and dignified friendship. But love that was feverish and burning, that was adoration, that was madness, it had taken John Thornton to arouse. This man had saved his life, which was something, but further, he was the ideal master. Other men saw to the welfare of their dogs from a sense of duty and business expediency. He saw to the welfare of his as if they were his own children, because he could not help it. And he saw further. He never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word, and to sit down for a long talk with them, gas, he called it, was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking Buck's head roughly between his hands, and resting his own head upon Buck's, of shaking him back and forth, the while calling him ill names that to Buck were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than that rough embrace, and the sound of murmured oaths, and at each jerk back and forth it seemed that his heart would be shaken out of his body, so great was its ecstasy. And when, released, he sprang to his feet, his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrant with unuttered sound, and in that fashion remained without movement, John Thornton would reverently exclaim, God, you can all but speak. Buck had a trick of love expression that was akin to hurt. He would often seize Thornton's hand in his mouth and close so fiercely that the flesh bore the impress of his teeth for some time afterward. And as Buck understood the oaths to be love words, so the man understood this feigned bite for a caress. For the most part, however, Buck's love was expressed in adoration. While he went wild with happiness when Thornton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. Unlike Skeet, 
who was wont to shove her nose under Thornton's hand and nudge and nudge till petted, or Nig, who would stalk up and rest his great head on Thornton's knee, Buck was content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the hour, eager, alert, at Thornton's feet, looking up into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following with keenest interest each fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature. Or, as chance might have it, he would lie farther away to the side or rear, watching the outlines of the man and the occasional movements of his body and often such was the communion in which they lived the strength of buck's gaze would draw john thornton's head around and he would return the gaze without speech his heart shining out of his eyes as buck's heart shone out for a long time after his rescue buck did not like thornton to get out of his sight from the moment he left the tent to when he entered it again buck would follow at his heels his transient master, since he had come into the Northland, had bred in him a fear that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life as Perrault and Francois and the Scotch half-breed had passed out. Even in the night, in his dreams, he was haunted by this fear. At such times he would shake off sleep and creep through the chill to the flap of the tent where he would stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. But in spite of this great love he bore John Thornton, which seemed to bespeak the soft, civilizing influence, the strain of the primitive, which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his, yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. He was a thane of the wild, come in from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the soft southland stamped with the marks of generations of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, but from any other man in any other camp, he did not hesitate an instant, while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body were scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fiercely as ever, and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. But the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valor, swiftly acknowledged Buck's supremacy, or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist. And Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe he had started on the way to death. He had lessened from Spitz and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail, and knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered, while to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten was the law, and this mandate, down out of the depths of time, he obeyed. He was older than the days he had seen, and the breaths he had drawn. He linked the past with the present, and the eternity behind him throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thornton's fire, a broad-breasted dog, white-fanged and long-furred, but behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half-wolves and wild-wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savor of the meat he ate, thirsting for the water he drank, scenting the wind with him, listening with him and telling him the sounds made by the wild life in the forest, dictating his moods, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him when he lay down, and dreaming with him and beyond him, and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So peremptorily did these shades beckon him, that each day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped farther from him. Deep in the forest a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, 
he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire and the beaten earth around it and to plunge into the forest and on and on he knew not where or why nor did he wonder where or why the call sounding imperiously deep in the forest but as often as he gained the soft unbroken earth and the green shade the love for john thornton drew him back to the fire again thornton alone held him the rest of mankind was as nothing chance travellers might praise or pet him but he was cold under it all and from a too demonstrative man he would get up and walk away when thornton's partners hans and pete arrived on the long-expected raft buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to thornton after that he tolerated them in a passive sort of way accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting they were of the same large type as thornton living close to the earth thinking simply and seeing clearly and ere they swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at dawson they understood buck and his ways and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with skeet and nig for thornton however his love seemed to grow and grow he alone among men could put a pack upon buck's back in the summer travelling nothing was too great for buck to do when thornton commanded one day they had grubstaked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left dawson for the headwaters of the tanana the men and dogs were sitting on the crest of a cliff which fell away straight down to naked bedrock three hundred feet below john thornton was sitting near the edge buck at his shoulder a thoughtless whim seized thornton and he drew the attention of hans and pete to the experiment he had in mind jump buck he commanded sweeping his arm out and over the chasm the next instant he was grappling with buck on the extreme edge while hans and pete were dragging them back into safety it's uncanny pete said after it was over and they had caught their speech thornton shook his head no it is splendid and it is terrible too do you know it sometimes makes me afraid i'm not hankering to be the man that lays hands on you while he's around pete announced conclusively nodding his head toward buck pai chingo was hans's contribution not myself either it was at circle city ere the year was out that pete's apprehensions were realized black burton a man evil-tempered and malicious had been picking a quarrel with a tenderfoot at the bar while thornton stepped good-naturedly between buck as was his custom was lying in a corner head on paws watching his master's every action burton struck out without warning straight from the shoulder thornton was sent spinning and saved himself from falling only by clutching the rail of the bar those who were looking on heard what was neither bark nor yelp but a something which is best described as a roar and they saw buck's body rise up in the air as he left the floor for burton's throat the man saved his life by instinctively throwing out his arm but was hurled backward to the floor with buck on top of him buck loosed his teeth from the flesh of the arm and drove in again for the throat this time the man succeeded only in partly blocking and his throat was torn open then the crowd was upon buck and he was driven off but while a surgeon checked the bleeding he prowled up and down growling furiously attempting to rush in and being forced back by an array of hostile clubs a miners meeting called on the spot decided that the dog had sufficient provocation and buck was discharged but his reputation was made and from that day his name spread through every camp in alaska later on in the fall of the year he saved john thornton's life in quite another fashion the three partners were landing a long and narrow poling boat down a bad stretch of rapids on the forty mile creek hans and pete moved along the bank snubbing with a thin manila rope from tree to tree while thornton remained in the boat helping this descent by means of a pole 
and shouting directions to the shore. Buck, on the bank, worried and anxious, kept abreast of the boat, his eyes never off his master. At a particularly bad spot, where a ledge of barely submerged rocks jutted out into the river, Hans cast off the rope, and while Thornton pulled the boat out into the stream, ran down the bank with the end in his hand to snub the boat when it had cleared the ledge. This it did, and was flying downstream in a current as swift as a mill race, when Hans checked it with the rope and checked too suddenly. The boat flirted over and snubbed into the bank bottom up, while Thornton, flung sheer out of it, was carried downstream toward the worst part of the rapid, a stretch of wild water in which no swimmer could live. Buck had sprung in on the instant, and at the end of three hundred yards, amid a mad swirl of water, he overhauled Thornton. When he felt him grasp his tail, Buck headed for the bank, swimming with all his splendid strength. But the progress shoreward was slow, the progress downstream amazingly rapid. From below came the fatal roaring where the wild current went wilder and was rent in shreds and spray by the rocks which thrust through like the teeth of an enormous comb. The suck of the water as it took the beginning of the last steep pitch was frightful, and Thornton knew that the shore was impossible. He scraped furiously over a rock, bruised across a second, and struck a third with crushing force. He clutched its slippery top with both hands, releasing Buck, and above the roar of the churning water shouted, Go, Buck, go! Buck could not hold his own, and swept on downstream, struggling desperately, but unable to win back. When he heard Thornton's command repeated, he partly reared out of the water, throwing his head high, as though for a last look, then turned obediently toward the bank. He swam powerfully and was dragged ashore by Pete and Hans at the very point where swimming ceased to be possible and destruction began. They knew that the time a man could cling to a slippery rock in the face of that driving current was a matter of minutes, and they ran as fast as they could up the bank to a point far above where Thornton was hanging on. They attached the line with which they had been snubbing the boat to Buck's head and shoulders, being careful that it should neither strangle him nor impede his swimming, and launched him into the stream. He struck out boldly, but not straight enough into the stream. He discovered the mistake too late when Thornton was abreast of him and a bare half-dozen strokes away while he was being carried helplessly past. Hans promptly snubbed with the rope, as though Buck were a boat. The rope thus tightening on him in the sweep of the current, he was jerked under the surface, and under the surface he remained till his body struck against the bank and he was hauled out. He was half drowned, and Hans and Pete threw themselves upon him, pounding the breath into him and the water out of him. He staggered to his feet and fell down. The faint sound of Thornton's voice came to them, and though they could not make out the words of it, they knew that he was in his extremity. His master's voice acted on Buck like an electric shock. He sprang to his feet and ran up the bank ahead of the men to the point of his previous departure. Again the rope was attached and he was launched, and again he struck out, but this time straight into the stream. He had miscalculated once, but he would not be guilty of it a second time. Hans paid out the rope, permitting no slack, while Pete kept it clear of coils. Buck held on till he was on a line straight above Thornton, then he turned, and with the speed of an express train headed down upon him. Thornton saw him coming, and, as Buck struck him like a battering ram, with the whole force of the current behind him, he reached up and closed with both arms around the shaggy neck. Hunt snubbed the rope around the tree, and Buck and Thornton were jerked under the water. Strangling, suffocating, sometimes one uppermost and sometimes the other, dragging over the jagged bottom, smashing against rocks and snags, they veered into the bank. Thornton came to, belly downward, and being violently propelled back and forth across a drift log by Hans and Pete. 
his first glance was for buck over whose limp and apparently lifeless body nig was setting up a howl while skeet was licking the wet face and closed eyes thornton was himself bruised and battered and he went carefully over buck's body when he had been brought around finding three broken ribs that settles it he announced we camp right here and camp they did till buck's ribs knitted and he was able to travel that winter at dawson buck performed another exploit not so heroic perhaps but one that put his name many notches higher on the totem pole of alaskan fame this exploit was particularly gratifying to the three men for they stood in need of the outfit which it furnished and were enabled to make a long desired trip into the virgin east where miners had not yet appeared it was brought about by a conversation in the el dorado saloon in which men waxed boastful of their favorite dogs buck because of his record was the target for these men and thornton was driven stoutly to defend him at the end of half an hour one man stated that his dog could start a sled with five hundred pounds and walk off with it a second bragged six hundred for his dog and a third seven hundred pooh pooh said john thornton buck can start a thousand pounds and break it out and walk off with it for a hundred yards demanded matheson of anansa king he of the seven hundred vaunt and break it out and walk off with it for a hundred yards john thornton said coolly well matheson said slowly and deliberately so that all could hear i've got a thousand dollars that says he can't and there it is so saying he slammed a sack of gold dust of the size of a bologna sausage down upon the bar nobody spoke thornton's bluff if bluff it was had been called he could feel a flush of warm blood creeping up his face his tongue had tricked him he did not know whether buck could start a thousand pounds half a ton the enormousness of it appalled him he had great faith in buck's strength and had often thought him capable of starting such a load but never as now had he faced the possibility of it the eyes of a dozen men fixed upon him silent and waiting further he had no thousand dollars nor had hans or pete i've got a sled standing outside now with twenty fifty-pound sacks of flour on it matheson went on with brutal directness so don't let that hinder you thornton did not reply he did not know what to say he glanced from face to face in the absent way of a man who has lost the power of thought and is seeking somewhere to find the thing that will start it going again the face of jim o'brien a mastodon king and old-time comrade caught his eyes it was as a cue to him seeming to rouse him to do what he would never have dreamed of doing can you lend me a thousand he asked almost in a whisper sure answered o'brien thumping down a plethoric sack by the side of matheson's though it's a little faith i'm having john that the beast can do the trick the eldorado emptied its occupants into the street to see the test the tables were deserted and the dealers and gamekeepers came forth to see the outcome of their wager and to lay odds several hundred men furred and mittened banked around the sled within easy distance matheson's sled loaded with a thousand pounds of flour had been standing for a couple of hours and in the intense cold it was sixty below zero the runners had frozen fast to the hard-packed snow men offered odds of two to one that buck could not budge the sled a quibble arose concerning the phrase break out o'brien contended it was thornton's privilege to knock the runners loose leaving buck to break it out from a dead standstill matheson insisted that the phrase included breaking the runners from the frozen grip of the snow a majority of the men who had witnessed the making of the bet decided in his favor whereat the odds went up to three to one against buck there were no takers not a man believed him capable of the feat thornton had been hurried into the wager heavy with doubt 
and now that he looked at the sled itself the concrete fact with the regular team of ten dogs curled up in the snow before it the more impossible the task appeared matheson waxed jubilant three to one he proclaimed i'll lay you another thousand at that figure thornton what do ye say thornton's doubt was strong in his face but his fighting spirit was aroused the fighting spirit that soars above odds fails to recognize the impossible and is deaf to all save the clamor for battle he called hans and pete to him their sacks were slim and with his own the three partners could rake together only two hundred dollars in the ebb of their fortunes this sum was their total capital yet they laid it unhesitatingly against matheson's six hundred the team of ten dogs was unhitched and buck with his own harness was put into the sled he had caught the contagion of the excitement and he felt that in some way he must do a great thing for john thornton murmurs of admiration at his splendid appearance went up he was in perfect condition without an ounce of superfluous flesh and the one hundred and fifty pounds that he weighed were so many pounds of grit and virility his furry coat shone with the sheen of silk down the neck and across the shoulders his mane in repose as it was half bristled and seemed to lift with every movement as though excess of vigor made each particular hair alive and active the great breast and heavy forelegs were no more than in proportion with the rest of the body where the muscles showed in tight rolls underneath the skin men felt these muscles and proclaimed them hard as iron and the odds went down to two to one gad sir gad sir stuttered a member of the latest dynasty a king of the skookum benches i offer you eight hundred for him sir before the test sir eight hundred just as he stands thornton shook his head and stepped to buck's side you must stand off from him matheson protested free play and plenty of room the crowd fell silent only could be heard the voices of the gamblers vainly offering two to one everyone acknowledged buck a magnificent animal but twenty fifty pound sacks of flour bulked too large in their eyes for them to loosen their pouch strings thornton knelt down by buck's side he took his head in his two hands and rested cheek on cheek he did not playfully shake him as was his wont or murmur soft love curses but he whispered in his ear as you love me buck as you love me was what he whispered buck whined with suppressed eagerness the crowd was watching curiously the affair was growing mysterious it seemed like a conjuration as thornton got to his feet buck seized his mittened hand between his jaws pressing in with his teeth and releasing slowly half reluctantly it was the answer in terms not of speech but of love thornton stepped well back now buck he said buck tightened the traces then slacked them for a matter of several inches it was the way he had learned gee thornton's voice rang out sharp in the tense silence buck swung to the right ending the movement in a plunge that took up the slack and with a sudden jerk arrested his one hundred and fifty pounds the load quivered and from under the runners arose a crisp crackling ha thornton commanded buck duplicated the manoeuvre this time to the left the crackling turned into a snapping the sled pivoting and the runners slipping and grating several inches to the side the sled was broken out men were holding their breaths intensely unconscious of the fact now mush thornton's command cracked out like a pistol shot buck threw himself forward tightening the traces with a jarring lunge his whole body was gathered compactly together in a tremendous effort the muscles writhing and nodding like live things under the silky fur his great chest was low to the ground his head forward and down while his feet were flying like mad the claws scarring the hard-packed snow in parallel grooves the sled swayed and trembled half started forward 
one of his feet slipped and one man groaned aloud then the sled lurched ahead in what appeared a rapid succession of jerks though it never really came to a dead stop again half an inch an inch two inches the jerks perceptibly diminished as the sled gained momentum he caught them up till it was moving steadily along men gasped and began to breathe again unaware that for a moment they had ceased to breathe thornton was running behind encouraging buck with short cheery words the distance had been measured off and as he neared the pile of firewood which marked the end of the hundred yards a cheer began to grow and grow which burst into a roar as he passed the firewood and halted at command every man was tearing himself loose even matheson hats and mittens were flying in the air men were shaking hands it did not matter with whom and bubbling over in a general incoherent babble but thornton fell on his knees beside buck head was against head and he was shaking him back and forth those who hurried up heard him cursing buck and he cursed him long and fervently and softly and lovingly gad sir gad sir spluttered the skookum bench king i'll give you a thousand for him sir a thousand sir twelve hundred sir thornton rose to his feet his eyes were wet the tears were streaming frankly down his cheeks sir he said to the skookum bench king no sir you can go to hell sir it's the best i can do for you sir buck seized thornton's hand in his teeth thornton shook him back and forth as though animated by a common impulse the onlookers drew back to a respectful distance nor were they again indiscreet enough to interrupt End of chapter six